Okay, uh, good morning. This is our fourth ecology lecture in the series of the postgraduate seminars of the Institute of Biology, University of Campinas. Uh, in the previous three occasions, we covered a lot of ground. We started with uh, climate change from a paleo point of view. We then looked at climate change again using uh, projection into the future where we consider the evolutionary adaptive potential of animals. In the third lecture, we looked at the impacts of atmospheric uh, nitrogen deposition on terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. And today we are looking at another aspect of global change, which is the introduction of ex exotic species. Uh, this lecture will be a very uh, interesting one because in addition to uh, considering the introduction of exotic species, it will cover all what ecology covers, uh, species interac interactions, biological interactions, uh, evolution, and the impacts that these have on the functioning of ecosystems, how ecosystems change, how the, the cycles of elements change. So. Today's uh, speaker is Professor Jason Huxma from University of uh, Mississippi. Uh, Jason, I let you introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Laszlo. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am Jason Huxma. I'm a biology professor at the University of Mississippi, which is located in a, a small town called Oxford in northern Mississippi in the southeastern United States. Uh, I've been here for uh, about 14 years, and before that I was a postdoc researcher at uh, Duke University and the Evolutionary Synthesis Center there, um, and before that a postdoc at the University of California in Santa Cruz, and uh, came to there from UC Davis in California where I got my PhD in ecology. Uh, and I'm glad to be here today. and. Uh, Indeed, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a system that uh, a group of us are working on, a, a large extended group of us are working on that allows us to address all kinds of different interesting questions in ecology and evolution. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen and get started. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk to you about introduced symbiotic fungi, uh, co-invasion with pinus hosts in the Southern Hemisphere and implications for biogeochemical cycles. All of this work, for me at least, is motivated in part by uh, this broad observation, which is that there is a lot of microbial diversity in soils. It's been estimated across a variety of studies that there can be 10 to the fourth up to 10 to the sixth species of microbes, that is bacteria, archaea, fungi uh, in soil uh, per gram of soil. Uh, and indeed more and more is known every, every day, every week, every month about the composition of these microbes, which species are there which lineages are present. Uh, but a big problem still is that we know relatively little about the functions of many of these microbial communities, including the soil fungi, which I'm going to focus on today. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is a bit of a story uh, of what I, call, what I think of as a major opportunity uh, and that is the co-introduction and co-invasion of pines and their ectomycorrhizal fungi in the Southern Hemisphere. So I want to introduce this system to you a little bit on this slide here with this map. Uh, what you can see across the Northern Hemisphere in- Jason. Yes? You're, you're not uh, 
<coughs> you're not forwarding the the slides and you're uh, um, you're not in presentation mode oh okay um let's try again uh how about now no you you, you haven't clicked on presentation mode in uh, at the bottom of your uh, powerpoint yeah uh, before the slide bar on the right hand side there is the the icon yeah yeah i did click there and on my screen it was showing ah that. Uh, why don't we um pull off the screen your presentation uh go into presentation mode straight away uh, before you share the screen and then try that okay. way. Okay. Okay, do you see the presentation? Yeah. And now is it in presentation mode? No. We can try this way if you can step one by one, uh, but the click will not forward the, the slides. Okay, we see the... the you see Anim the if you see the animation panel on the right, you see your slide, yeah. Yeah, do you see the second slide now? Yeah, we do, yeah. Okay. And now still the second slide? Still the second slide, yeah. And is it working? Well, it shows the second slide, um, but it's in edit mode. <laughs> you can, we can see... It, on display your um, your animation, the numbering on the slide of the animation. Huh. Okay. Now, is it working now? Uh, the uh, animation panel disappeared. Uh, you're okay. still uh, showing on the left-hand side the uh, the slides. Okay. Well, I'm not sure what's going wrong. Um, I'm going into into um, presentation mode, and it's not translating across the the format. Okay, I, I think we can go with this. You just have to step down on the right hand side slide by slide when you're um, when you're showing the slides. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So to reiterate the first point, this work is motivated by the observation that microbial diversity in soils is gigantic. And we still know relatively little about the functions of many microbial communities. Uh, so this is the system that I wanna tell you about today, uh, which is pine and ectomycorrhizal fungal introductions from the Northern hemisphere into the Southern hemisphere. In gray, you can see the uh, range of pines, uh, the genus Pinus, uh, which is largely restricted to the Northern hemisphere. And in red, is many of the uh, places where pines have been introduced into the Southern Hemisphere. So much of South America, uh, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and elsewhere. And in uh, reviewing information 
about the system, there are a lot of really interesting patterns. Uh, first of all, the composition and diversity of ectomycorrhizal fungi, which I'm going to abbreviate as EM fungi, is really highly variable among sites where these introductions have taken place. Uh, there's also highly variable introduction history um, in terms of the timing, uh, where these introductions came from, where the pines came from, where the fungi came from, uh, and also a great deal of variation in the types of soils and plant communities into which these introductions are taking place, ranging from mountain grasslands to shrublands to uh, ectomycorrhizal forests and arbuscular mycorrhizal forests. Uh, here is an image from Ritas Vilgelis, uh, one of my collaborators on this work, showing uh, that he put together showing the some of the diversity of where the fungi came from that have been introduced into the southern hemisphere. Uh, so from Europe, quite a few species, including uh, four different species of Suillus, uh, Amanita muscaria, the famous fly agaric mushroom. From North America in the West, especially from the range of Pinus radiata, the, the radiata pine on the, in California, uh, species of, from, from fun, fungal species from that system have been introduced into Australia and New Zealand, especially. From the Eastern side of North America, uh, many species as well from Mississippi, from North Carolina, from the southeastern U.S. into South America, Australia, and South Africa. Uh, here are some images from Redis also from the Blue Mountains of Australia showing some of the key players uh, that are living in that system now. In these introduced pine forests, you have Pinus radiata with several of the common ectomycorrhizal fungi, including Amanita, Suillus, uh, Rhizopogon, uh, and Inosibi. Um, one really interesting phenomenon is that we see in these exotic locations uh, super abundant fruiting by particular mushroom species. Here's an example of Lactarius deliciosus. Uh, Suillus is also commonly part of this phenomenon. And uh, this observation has always intrigued me because I've wondered uh, why would a mushroom species uh, fruit so abundantly in the exotic range compared to its native range? Uh, what is going on there? That's, that's, been, that's an observation that has been interesting to me for a long time. Uh, is it that it is simply uh, finding a novel environment with fewer enemies, uh, fewer pests, uh, higher resource availability, reduced competition from other species? Uh, perhaps uh, evolutionary changes have contributed to this phenomenon. Uh, one particular species that is going to receive um, special focus in this talk and in some of this work is Suillus luteus, uh, which is one of the slippery jack species. It is the most commonly reported uh, mushroom uh, in many places where pines have been introduced into the Southern hemisphere. Uh, it's native to Eurasia, uh, but has been widely introduced across the Southern hemisphere in Oceania. Um, it's an abundant fruiter across the exotic range, and it plays a key role in the spread of pines uh, facilitated by ectomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and a nice feature is that it, uh, there is a reference genome sequence available, uh, so it, there's the potential for uh, informative genomic work as well. So that's just a bit of background on this system. Uh, and I wanna mention now three research questions that I think are really interesting and that have the potential to be answered and addressed in this system. Uh, one of them is to ask what scale of biodiversity that is ranging from genes to transcripts to individual species up to communities or phylogenetic lineages, which, which scale of biodiversity best predicts the ecosystem functions of fungal communities? This is a fundamental question about microbial communities. How do we predict their function? Uh, secondly, what are the roles of plasticity versus genetic drift versus adaptive evolution 
in how fungal traits evolve and how they influence the properties of ecosystems. And then finally, how is fungal trait evolution influenced by its biotic and abiotic context? These to me are some of the more interesting questions in microbial ecology uh, and biology more broadly. And all of them can potentially be addressed in this system of introduced pines and their ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, so uh, I'm just one uh, member of a really broad group of collaborators and uh, researchers working on these and related questions in this system. And some of the approaches being used uh, among our collaborators include uh, studies at native sites in Europe and in the US, including Mississippi, North Carolina, and California. Uh, international collaborations, including uh, in a variety of different habitats. Uh, Brazil in an arbuscular mycorrhizal dominated forest, Australia in ectomycorrhizal eucalyptus forest, in Argentina where the systems are mountainous uh, arbuscular grasslands, and in South Africa in the Finbos shrub and grassland there. We are looking at functions, especially focusing on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycling, uh, using multi-omics uh, at different scales of molecular biology to characterize molecular functional traits of fungi, uh, population genomics of dominant fungi, cross inoculation experiments, testing genotypes of native and exotic populations of plants, fungi, uh, and environments in native and exotic environments, meta-analysis and ecosystem modeling. And putting all of these together, we have the potential to make significant advances in answering some of these questions. But this work requires collaboration. This, this system and these kinds of questions are inherently uh, lend themselves to international collaboration. And that's an important part of what's going on. Uh, this is a paper that many of you read in preparation for this lecture. Uh, I want to credit in advance uh, many of the collaborators who are involved in this work um, who are listed here and some of whom will be highlighted in more detail uh, in a few minutes. And other collaborators are also in heavily involved and will be mentioned later in the talk as well. But many of the ideas uh, that I'm going to talk about today um, are laid out in this paper and elaborated on, and that would be a good place for more detail for citations, uh, et cetera, on these topics. Uh, a key figure from that paper, I think this is figure three, um, goes through uh, some of what we do know and some of what we are hypothesizing and some of what we are wondering about this system. And I wanna start from the top to set up this background. Uh, first of all, uh, in native pine and ectomycorrhizal fungal populations, we generally see relatively high ectomycorrhizal fungal diversity in those systems in North America, in Europe, and Asia. Uh, and by high ectomycorrhizal fungal diversity, here we mean often upwards of 100 or more species of fungi associating with a particular pine species. Uh, and then what has happened over the course of uh, hundreds of years, in fact, is the co-introduction of pines and ectomycorrhizal fungi into the Southern Hemisphere. And co-introduction uh, became necessary because when plantations of pines were first uh, attempted to be established in the Southern Hemisphere, it was found that they could not grow uh, without ectomycorrhizal fungi, without soil and the microbes from those soils from the Northern Hemisphere, from their native populations. Uh, eventually, uh, successfully, established were a host of exotic pine plantations. And what, in surveying these pine plantations across the globe, uh, it has generally been found that they contain relatively low ectomycorrhizal fungal diversity, uh, 
and novel plant fungal combinations. Often, as you might expect from the graphic I showed earlier, we find pines from one continent, for example, pines from the USA, such as Pinus radiata, uh, teaming up with fungi from Europe or from another part of the Northern hemisphere and thriving together in these plantations. Uh, so we see novel combinations, but during the co-introduction process, there has been filtering of ectomycorrhizal fungi due to what I'm going to refer to as response traits. So this is a, a point um, I want to make, which is that there's a really useful framework that has been applied to several aspects of global change work, and that is the response effect trait framework. Response traits are traits of organisms that cause them to differentially respond to a particular um, uh, global change phenomenon, such as uh, global warming, uh, nitrogen deposition, or uh, introduction uh, into an exotic environment. And so presumably due to particular traits such as tolerating uh, the introduction process, tolerating the stresses involved with being transported across the globe, certain ectomycorrhizal fungi have thrived uh, through the introduction process. And that has resulted in a filtering of these fungal communities so that we end up with a lower diversity in plantations. Uh, then subsequently in many uh, habitats throughout the Southern hemisphere, we have seen then co-invasion of pines out of plantations into native habitats. Uh, but pines cannot co-invade into native habitats without uh, the ectomycorrhizal fungi. And what we see is that often a subset of ectomycorrhizal fungi co-invade with pines into native habitats so that diversity is even further reduced in these invasion fronts, in these invaded habitats. Uh, one pattern that has been seen is that suiloid fungi, especially suilis and rhizopogon, tend to dominate in these invasive populations of pines and fungi. Uh, and then in blue with question marks here, I've highlighted a couple of key questions. Uh, these are not areas that we understand well, but they're areas that I think are really interesting that have a lot to be learned. Uh, and we have hypotheses about what might be going on. One of them is that plant and fungal populations may be evolving rapidly in these uh, plantations and invasion sites. Uh, in novel environments where species are introduced, there is a great potential for rapid evolution because uh, natural selection may be stronger in due to novel abiotic conditions, novel uh, species that are encountered, and uh, with fungi uh, that, who have fairly rapid generation times, we might expect rapid evolution to have a high potential uh, although this is not well understood yet in ectomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, rapid evolution um, has been rarely demonstrated in these fungi and not in exotic populations. Uh, secondly, uh, we hypothesize that these co-introductions and co-invasions may have strong effects on native species and ecosystem processes due to effect traits. I'm going to come back to the response effect trait framework and remind you that uh, response traits are traits of fungi or other species that cause different species to respond differently to uh, a global change phenomenon. Effect traits are traits that uh, allow those species to have particular effects on recipient ecosystems or in subsequent systems. So if response traits are correlated with effect traits, then we may be able to predict the consequences, the functional effects of a, a global change phenomenon. So if some of the same traits that cause species to respond differently to introduction also cause them to have particular effects on native ecosystems, uh, then we may be able to predict the consequences of these introductions. So for example, if suiloid fungi, 
have particular effects on ecosystems, uh, then uh, we may be able to predict uh, what those effects are in response to these introductions. And I'll come back to that idea in a minute. Uh, I wanna move to a first concrete example. And here I'm gonna highlight the work from Tomas Milani. Uh, this is really nice work from Argentina. Tomas is a PhD student uh, working with Francois Test uh, in Argentina at the University of San Luis. And uh, they have developed a really intriguing system to study uh, this phenomenon, and that is in the Sierras uh, de Cordoba in the mountains, mountain grasslands of Argentina, where historically there were no ectomycorrhizal plants or fungi. And so this is a really nice system uh, to study this phenomenon because everything is new uh, from the side of the pines and their fungi. Uh, and pictured here is one of the field sites where they have a uh, slash pine and uh, pine and uh, uh, loblolly pine in invading into these grasslands after, after having been introduced about 40 or 50 years ago uh, through a government program. And here is part of the team uh, from left to right, uh, Florencia Spallazzi, Tomas himself, and Francois, uh, the PI of this project on the top right there after having girdled uh, a pine tree, I believe. One result I wanna mention from this work uh, is just to show, first of all, that Suillus luteus is in fact a dominant species in the system. Uh, this is uh, showing species of ectomycorrhizal fungi down the left uh, from pine soil, from pine roots, and from the grasslands that had not been invaded yet. Uh, and Suillus luteus is dominant in the soil and also in the spore bank of the grassland. Although interestingly, it is not found commonly on the roots of the pines. And so we do see domination by Suillus here, but also mm, quite a few other species are important. And uh, there are rare species as well that are not shown in this graph. Uh, a second key result, uh, and maybe the most interesting aspect uh, of this work is that uh, instead of finding uh, a change in diversity and composition and a decrease in diversity over space, uh, going from plantations out into the grasslands where the invasion is taking place, uh, a stronger predictor of species composition in this system is the age of the pines. And it turns out that this system is informing us of, of something interesting, a general point, which is that uh, in some of these introductions, uh, the age and distance and space from the plantations, the age of the introduction and the distance from uh, the plantation are, are correlated with each other. But in this system here, uh, they are decoupled. And that's another interesting aspect of this system. Uh, and in systems where they are decoupled, uh, age and space, we see uh, age becoming a more important predictor of the fungal community in these systems. Here is a graphic from uh, Tomas's manuscript illustrating this point. So on the top is uh, uh, a graphic really representing what I think we used to think mostly these systems looked like, where you have plantation at the left, and then invasion stretching out to the right with younger and younger trees. And you see different fungi and fewer species as you go out into the invasion front. However, in the Sierras de Cordoba and uh, perhaps in other similar systems, age and distance are decoupled. Um, the invasion is maturing to a point where uh, older trees are found quite a long distance from the plantation and they are accumulating quite a uh, large and diverse community of fungi. Um, so to put this in the broader context, this is also from Tomas's paper, um, comparing the results from this system on the far left, where we have Pinus eliadii and Pinus teta in mountain grasslands of Argentina. Uh, notice the 
number of ectomycorrhizal fungal species on the y-axis is higher in this system than uh, especially in the overall uh, fungal community. And also if you just focus on the invasive fungi, it's higher in this system than any system that has been previously documented. So it's a bit atypical in some ways, but on the other hand, uh, this kind of work has barely been done in very many different communities. So it may turn out to be quite representative. And the major point here, uh, and I should say, uh, going across from left to right, these are all different studies that have been done in different pine invasion systems, uh, finding variable levels of diversity uh, inside plantations, in the invasion fronts, and across the whole total community. Uh, the point I wanna make here is that clearly uh, emerging from this work and comparing it to others, uh, composition and diversity of these invasive fungi is highly variable uh, among sites. And while we do see dominance by Suillus and uh, related taxa, uh, there are a lot of other important species and sometimes diversity can be quite high. Um, I want to also briefly highlight here some work being done by Nawel Polacelli, who's a, currently a postdoc in Jenny Botnagar's lab. Uh, and this is from a really nice emerging study, which is a meta-analysis across uh, more than 100 different papers in which uh, Nawel's analyses have identified that the fungal associations of pines seem to be among the best predictors of the invasion status of the pine species themselves and better than above ground traits of the pines. So the fungi that the pines associate with, which on the x-axis here is especially the abundance of late invasive ectomycorrhizal species. These are species of fungi that tend to be found later on in invasions. Those seem to be the best predictor of the uh, uh, number of invasive occurrences found for particular pine species. So across all of these different pines, uh, when these pines are most associated with late invasive fungi, that is when they are most invasive. And uh, this is just building the story of how this is a co-invasion and these pines are dependent on the fungi. Not only can they not invade without these fungi, but the particular fungi that are found with the pines influences their invasion status. Okay, so those examples, um, I think, help to illustrate uh, some of the points highlighted by the yellow arrows here, um, especially on the process of co-introduction, how the fungal community may be filtered, uh, and perhaps putting an asterisk by this conclusion here of low ectomycorrhizal diversity in exotic pine plantations, um, but making the point that it really varies a lot among systems. And to me, this is an opportunity and we'll talk about that opportunity a bit more here in a minute. I wanna focus now on this pheno potential phenomenon of rapid evolution in these exotic plant and fungal populations. And as I mentioned before, it's really an open question still. Um, so first of all, a bit of background. Uh, we know from previous studies uh, from my lab and from others that there is abundant genetic variation in native populations of pines and their ectomycorrhizal fungi for interesting traits such as their compatibility with particular hosts. Uh, a, a wide variety of experiments have demonstrated a high level of diversity in these, in these populations, uh, genetic diversity, which means that there's a potential for uh, rapid evolution in these populations. Without this genetic diversity, natural selection could not act on these populations when introduced. Uh, but moving forward to understand whether evolution is happening in these exotic populations, uh, there's some interesting work going on uh, in uh, the laboratory of Ritas Vilgelis, uh, my close collaborator at Duke University. And that work is being led by Yi Hong Ki, who's a PhD student there with Ritas, studying the population genomics of Suillus luteus. Suillus luteus is this mushroom that I highlighted earlier. It was the most abundant species in, in the Argentina system we just talked about. 
uh, and indeed is often the most abundant mushroom. Uh, and uh, Yi Hong is studying the population structure and divergence uh, in exotic and native populations, demographic history, mating system, and potentially adaptation as well. Um, I'll just show you a few data from shotgun sequencing uh, of about 150 samples from the native and exotic range. Um, so here is one really interesting result. Uh, this is a PCA plot. Uh, and what you can see is that the populations that were sequenced are color coded. So black is Australia here. Uh, New Zealand is in blue. Red is Europe, which is the native site. Uh, North America is in green, which is right on top of the red there. And then South America is in this other blue color over here. And some conclusions initially from this result are, first of all, that the introduction from Europe to New Zealand and Australia uh, seems to uh, be documented here, but perhaps by independent introductions uh, followed by admixture. So you can see this uh, movement in genetic similarity from the red cluster in Europe here out to Australia, but over to New Zealand here as well. Um, a second conclusion from this graphic is uh, you can apparently see a separate uh, evidence of a separate introduction from Europe to South America, which is, includes Argentina and Chile. And then a third conclusion is seeing uh, these samples from North America on top of the European samples suggests very little genetic differentiation in North America from Europe, suggesting probably a recent introduction and little spread. Uh, a PhD student of mine, Brooke Allen, is working on uh, evolution of these exotic fungi from a different perspective and using a different approach. Uh, she's also working on Suillus luteus genomes, but focusing on identifying biosynthetic gene clusters in these fungi and asking whether those biosynthetic gene clusters have evolved rapidly in the exotic populations. These gene clusters code for many of the molecules that we think are involved in uh, regulating the symbiosis with host plants. And so this is a potentially a genomic hotspot of focus for uh, evolution when these uh, fungi are introduced to uh, systems that have novel host plants. And Secondly, she'll be performing a series of cross inoculation experiments using genotypes of pines and fungi from, uh, for example, Mississippi and South Africa, Mississippi and Argentina, California and Hawaii, and uh, also Europe and Australia. Okay, and finally, I want to focus for a few minutes on this last uh, blue arrow here, which is our uh, our second big question, and that is how these exotic introductions and invasions may be affecting uh, ecosystem processes. And I'll introduce here a second example, which is pines and ectomycorrhizal fungi in invading into eucalypt forests in Australia. And this work is being led especially by Redis Vilgelis from at Duke University uh, and members of his lab and uh, his collaborative network. So here on this map is shown occurrences of pines in Australia and New Zealand. And you can see that they're extensive, especially in Southeastern Australia, but also in Western Australia, in the Northeast and across New Zealand. Here's an image from uh, one site where Pinus radiata is mixing in with native eucalyptus. And uh, one aspect of this work that I wanna highlight is what I'll refer to as a transect study, utilizing sites in California where Pinus radiata is native uh, and also moving from uh, into Australia from pl pine plantations in the center of plantations to the plantation edges to pine invasion sites and then into native eucalyptus forest. And this is work that is being done collaboratively uh, including by Coco Chen, Sunny Lau, uh, Corinne Vieturish, who I'm going to highlight in a minute again, uh, 
uh, uh, who is working with Jenny Botnagar, Alejo Rojas, uh, Yihang Ki and Ritas, and uh, many others. One result from studies of this uh, transect from California and across the edges of these invasions in Australia, uh, one result is shown here. And this is um, uh, from uh, fungal metagenomics in soils, focusing on the ITS1 locus from uh, more than 370 soil samples. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, uh, graphics that illustrate enrichment of certain taxa in comparisons of, for example, plantation versus native. In plantations, you see a higher enrichment of Rhizopogon and Suillus and several other taxa compared to the native eucalyptus forest where most of the fungi, interestingly, are uh, unidentified um, uh, agaricomycete fungi, but a lot of ascomycete fungi. Uh, enrichment of plantation versus invasive populations. In the invasive populations, you especially see, again, Rhizopogon and Suillus, but also Clavulina. Uh, and then if you compare native versus invasive, this is native uh, eucalyptus forest compared to the invasive pines, you again see Rhizopogon and Suillus coming out on top. Um, to get to the ecosystem level, I wanna mention some analyses being done by Corinne uh, Vietarish, who is a PhD student at Boston University with Jenny Botnagar. And they've been analyzing data uh, from this transect study provided by Coco Chen and Sunny Lau. And I wanna draw your attention first to the y-axis, which shows percent nitrogen on the y-axis, uh, and then forest type on the x-axis. So you have plantations here, invaded uh, eucalyptus forest, native eucalyptus forest that is uninvaded, and then here is the native pines in California. So focus here, first of all, on the comparison between native eucalyptus forest and invaded eucalyptus forest. And notice that the percent nitrogen is substantially lower in the invaded forest. Uh, if we look at phosphorus, it's a similar pattern. Uh, invaded forest has substantially lower bulk phosphorus compared to native eucalyptus forest. And these observations, along with uh, thinking about the traits of fungi that are dominant in these invasions, has led us to uh, think about and propose several different hypotheses, one of which is illustrated here. And that is what um, might be called the Suillus or Suilloid end mining hypothesis. And this relies on the idea that suiloid ectomycorrhizal fungi um, may be dominating in many of these invasion sites and that they possess uh, particular traits, uh, particular effect traits. Uh, and that includes the ability to access organic forms of nutrients such as nitrogen uh, from soils compared to other ectomycorrhizal fungi that do not possess such a strong ability to access organic nitrogen. Um, one thing that we've noticed is that a correlated trait um, is that is the nitrophobicity and nitrophilicity of these fungi. So suiloid fungi tend to be fairly nitrophobic. Uh, they prefer and they thrive in soils that do not have high nitrogen availability. On the other hand, you have a set of taxa like Paxillus, Scleroderma, Thalephora that seem to actually respond very positively to nitrogen deposition. And they, they thrive in soils with a relatively high availability of nitrogen. Uh, and so uh, along the x-axis here of soil mineral nitrogen availability, on the far end on the right, you have a higher abundance of these nitrophilic fungi. To the left, you have a higher abundance of suiloid fungi. And what this idea suggests is that, and the trade-off here, sorry, the, the, the y-axis I should mention is uh, ability of fungi to mine soil organic nitrogen or to pull soil organic nitrogen out of the soil uh, and pass it along to host plants. So this 
dashed line here is a hypothesized trade-off between organic nitrogen access and soil mineral N availability. So what we're hypothesizing is that at sites with higher nitrogen availability, you may see uh, less of this dominance by suiloid taxa and more dominance by these nitrophilic taxa. Uh, at other sites with lower soil nitrogen availability, we may see uh, higher abundances of suiloid fungi, suilus and rhizopogon especially, and increased organic uh, nitrogen acquisition. And so this could create a positive feedback where at these sites, suiloid fungi are preferred, are, are uh, uh, facilitated, and then they further deplete soil nitrogen availability through mining of organic matter. Uh, so this is a hypothesis uh, that um, needs to be tested. And I wanna just spend a minute talking then about how to test hypotheses like this. Uh, so one idea is to use uh, a natural experiment. Um, so for example, if we could find a nitrogen availability gradient across Australia. So for example, there may be uh, a gradient in nitrogen deposition from industrial areas. Uh, there may be natural gradients of soil nitrogen availability, in which case we might predict uh, that at certain sites, we would see higher suiloid dominance and higher uh, levels of nitrogen, uh, organic nitrogen being mined from the soil and vice versa. This would be taking advantage of what we would call a natural experiment where across the landscape, we have had a phenomenon uh, that has occurred. Introduction and invasion of plants and fungi across a diversity of sites that differ in their nitrogen availability and in their fungal composition. And we can take advantage of that then by measuring nutrient uh, availabilities and other ecosystem properties, and then performing analyses that try to predict uh, those ecosystem properties from those underlying uh, natural experiment conditions. However, uh, a key point is that that would be an observational study where we have not manipulated the underlying predictor variables. We would have not manipulated the nitrogen gradient explicitly. We would have not manipulated fungal composition or the introduction and invasion process. And so there are some limitations to what you can conclude uh, from such a study. And so for example, from uh, this really intriguing uh, work here, we still need to ask whether invasive ectomycorrhizal fungi are driving lower soil nitrogen and phosphorus in this system, or were they simply preferentially choosing sites with inherently lower nitrogen and phosphorus, or is it both? Uh, is it a positive feedback that's going on? Um, to tease that apart, we may need to consider also including experimental studies where uh, these variables are manipulated. So perhaps you would um, choose fungi suiloid fungi and uh, on the other hand, uh, some nitrophilic fungi, introduce them into uh, artificial environments that have higher and lower nitrogen availability uh, and, and then measure uh, organic nitrogen acquisition, uh, mineral nitrogen acquisition and uh, track changes in these pools of, uh, of resources over time. And an experimental approach like that could really help complement the field observational studies that have already been done. Okay, uh, just a few conclusions to summarize what we've talked about. Uh, first of all, a lesson from uh, the work of my collaborators and others is that not all of these ectomycorrhizal co-invasion systems are the same. Some are more diverse and age structured but this diversity uh, provides opportunities to look at variation in fungal composition and diversity over the landscape and among systems, uh, and to ask how that predicts other things that we're interested in, such as evolution and ecosystem responses. Um, Suiloid dominance seems to be an important pattern that consistently appears, but other EM fungal taxa are also prominent, and we need to understand more about uh, how variation among sites in the dominance of suiloid fungi 
why that is, how that is caused, and also the consequences of it functionally for ecosystems. Um, third, from Yihong's work, it's clear that ectomycorrhizal fungi are evolving in the exotic range, but which traits are evolving and, and why? In what response to what factors? Is it genetic drift? Is it in response to natural selection? Uh, what is going on with evolution? Fourth, uh, pine ectomycorrhizal invasions are clearly associated with changes in soil biochemistry, but what is the mechanism? Uh, we need to test hypotheses like the uh, Sewilloid end mining hypothesis and other ideas uh, using additional natural experiments and manipulative experiments. And then finally, uh, uh, overall, these systems are useful uh, as natural experiments, but manipulative experiments are going to be needed as well. Okay, I'll stop there and we'll be happy to take any questions uh, that might have arisen during the talk. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. It's fascinating. Fascinating talking about uh, introduced exotic invasive species that we normally uh, consider as um, something bad, something that we immediately want to get rid of. And yet, uh, after your talk, people who are uh, watching and listening to us must realize that perhaps before um, reaching for the chainsaw to eliminate invasive pines, we could we could use this system, this fascinating system that it offers for for learning a lot of things that we we can uh, learn about, as you put it, at different levels of biodiversity from from genes to to ecosystem functioning. Uh, to, to enhance our understanding. Uh, one point that I would like to uh, 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 point out is the interesting case of, of Pinus radiata, which is apparently a, a narrow range endemic uh, to California, and yet it has become one of the pine species that is most widely uh, planted in the Southern Hemisphere, in New Zealand, Australia, Chile, Argentina, and has become one of the, as, you sh as you've shown in one of the figures, have become one of the most, uh, in these places, the most invasive uh, of pine species. Um, so we, we have a lot of questions um, that, in addition to what, what you listed as what we can learn, there is a lot that we can learn about biogeography as well. Um, the um, we have a few questions that we received, and uh, uh, I don't know if you see them. I can um, start reading them out. Marcella ask, asks you if you have that uh, exist uh, certain clues of some kind of asymmetric climate limitation of the co-invasion of the, the fungi and the, and the pine uh, species. And if, if it can result in in um, um, configuring the, the composition of uh, the uh, vegetation and the microflora? That's an interesting question. I think by asymmetric, uh, you may, may mean that the climate limitation is different for the yeah. plants versus the fungi uh, or different for different species of fungi. Um, well, so uh, I think one key point is that uh, you need to think about some of these symbioses uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the holobiont. So you have the, the symbiont and the host, but ultimately these are species that are dependent on each other. Uh, they're obligately dependent on each other. So what you need is for the, the holobiont, the combination of the two, to be able to survive in a particular climate. Uh, but on the other hand, it's an open system where plants can presumably choose partners and fungi can choose partners. And so the plant needs to be able to tolerate the climate itself and so does the fungus. And my prediction would be that different fungal species would have different climatic tolerances and that that may indeed be filtering uh, the fungal community. And that's something we really don't understand very well. Um, so it's a good question, but I would say we really don't know the answer yet. Um, there is another question which I'm trying to, uh, 
what maximum extent is interaction uh, accumulation driven by co-invasion with uh, pinus versus novel associations i believe mm. it's uh-huh yeah so uh interestingly first of all these pines uh, they cannot usually take advantage of ectomycorrhizal fungi from from the native systems so for example in australia we have many ectomycorrhizal plants such as eucalyptus uh, but mostly the fungi associated with eucalyptus cannot colonize pines and the pines cannot uh, uh, take advantage of them. The pines cannot associate with those fungi. Um, and similarly, in many cases, the fungi associated with pines cannot jump onto native uh, plants. So um, it's fairly restricted. There are exceptions to this. Uh, for example, Amanita muscaria has jumped away from pines onto native plants, especially in New Zealand, and has spread more widely uh, there because of that. But um, with these pine systems, that's the exception uh, rather than the rule. So they seem to stick fairly closely together. On the other hand, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of examples of uh, pines from one native habitat in North America, for example, associating with fungi from Europe together in the Southern Hemisphere, often being dispersed by mammals from another place. Uh, so there's plenty of novel combinations, but most of them are not from the recipient uh, communities. If I remember correctly, there is some sort of limited exchange of the fungal uh, uh, species between species of uh, Pinus, Principilla uh, Pinus radiata, and uh, Notophagus in, in Argentina as well. But it's limited again. Mm -hmm. The big question is why? The why? Mm. Yeah. The yeah, well, it goes back, I mean, ultimately, it goes back to the evolution of host specificity. Um, and the evolution of host specificity is a, a fascinating topic, um, asking why does host specificity evolve? Why would, why would fungi evolve to limit their interactions so that they can only interact with pinus? And why would pinus uh, limit their interactions only with particular fungi? Um, at some level, there must be an evolutionary, there must be an advantage, an ecological advantage um, to specializing in those interactions. And so natural selection has favored over time uh, more and more specialization in some of these symbioses. There must be an advantage in terms of efficiency uh, or an advantage in terms of, uh, for example, if, if you are um, the pine and you are limiting your interactions to a certain set of fungi, that may be, uh, that has evolved because uh, there's an advantage to doing that and keeping out fungi that are not as beneficial. There may be fungi that would, uh, would readily colonize the pine, but the pine keeps them out and, and that may be driven by uh, inefficiencies uh, in the symbiosis that would happen if the pine allowed those fungi to colonize the roots. And so we can speculate about that, but, um, you know, there's a wide range of different levels of host specificity in ectomycorrhizal interactions. Some fungi are very broad and some are very narrow. Um, certainly that host specificity is part of what's driving uh, these patterns. Yeah, what is interesting that in the no northern hemisphere you very often find that pine and other conifer uh, mycorrhizal species also uh, they are shared with angiosperm species whilst when you when you introduce uh, pine species which with the exception of one they are all restricted to the northern hemisphere you, you when you introduce them to the southern hemisphere they will face only angiosperm species who are uh, which are ectomycorrhizal, so there might be a question of um, 
um, not only in, in evolutionary time, but also the, the, the space and the, and the uh, kind of geological and geographic um, uh, separation and distance. Yeah, certainly. Okay, there is a, another question here uh, coming from Linda, who is um, asking that um, uh, most uh, species in, uh, in South America, with the exception of the, the temperate uh, subantarctic part of South America and Chile and Argentina, are predominantly AM uh, uh, fungi. Uh, associated with the uh, uh, species, so the the <coughs> ECM ectomycrotic species are very very rare. So the question is: the introduction of these ectomycorrhizal species, where the roots are surrounded by uh, a, a fun fungal mycelium, uh, uh, would that help these um, uh, further the invasion of these species? giving this protection from certain uh, local um, soil-borne uh, pathogens, such as nematodes. Hmm. Um, so the introduction into an ectomycorrhizal system or into an arbuscular system? In the, uh, into an arbuscular. Hmm. Well, the question of uh, what happens differently when these introductions happen into recipient communities that are arbuscular versus ectomycorrhizal is really interesting. Um, just to step back for a minute, uh, I didn't talk a lot about that, but um, indeed a big question that is being addressed with, with modeling and all kinds of field work uh, and empirical studies as well right now across the globe is what is inherently different between ectomycorrhizal forests and arbuscular mycorrhizal forests and other arbuscular systems in terms of their nutrient cycling. Uh, and the fact that these pine introductions happen in arbuscular and ectosystems provides potentially an opportunity for comparing uh, those dynamics. And we, may, we would predict from uh, work done in native systems uh, that you know, certain key features of the ecosystem functions uh, may differ, uh, but uh, I haven't thought a lot about what might differ between them in terms of the biotic context. Uh, certainly in one thing we really want to know is why do certain fungi in these systems thrive so much in the exotic environment? And one possibility as the question alludes to is uh, uh, enemy release or enemy escape. So uh, the enemy escape hypothesis or enemy release hypothesis is commonly invoked to explain certain kinds of introductions, successful invasions. And the idea is that in the native range, species are kept in check. Their populations are suppressed by pathogens and pests, herbivores, enemies of various kinds. And in the exotic range, uh, many of those enemies are not present. Uh, and I would say we understand very, very little about, first of all, the enemies of ectomycorrhizal fungi in these exotic systems uh, and whether they are less abundant than they are in native systems. Um, we barely know uh, who is eating these fungi in these exotic environments. Um, some of the work going on, I think, uh, in, in Laszlo's lab and um, maybe Linda herself working on nematodes in these systems is really important for making progress on this question, uh, but it's a very uh, a limited set of studies that I'm aware of trying to understand who are the enemies of these fungi uh, in these exotic systems. We need more data. Uh, I think it's certainly an interesting possibility that uh, the invading into an arbuscular system may protect the ecto fungi because the, uh, the native uh, enemies are not adapted there to ecto fungi. So in an arbuscular mycorrhizal forest, potentially the nematodes and other enemies are, um, are adapted to eating the roots and fungi of arbuscular mycorrhizal plants. Uh, 
Uh, it may require different traits in the in the enemies in the nematodes, and that may allow uh, um, a free reign and, and escape from enemies for the ectomycorrhizal fungi. That's an interesting uh, uh, possibility. Yeah, what Linda didn't add that she probably should have that what she found that uh, in the in in the in the pine plantation compared with our native araucaria forest, araucaria is another conifer, but it's uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal, or in surrounding uh, um, uh, grassland, grassy shrubby vegetation. So in the pine, the the abundance of overall abundance of uh, nematodes was significantly lower than in the native system. So. Mm. Uh, the, obviously, the why is st uh, still remains. The observation is there, and um, well, she should be publishing it at some point. Cool. I look forward to seeing that. Here comes the next question from Jennifer. It says, "Jason, about soil changes studied with pesticide use in general, could they be promising to discover the mechanisms making a more controlled experimental design, or would it, or wouldn't it help?" I suppose we're talking about uh, application of fungicides or bactericides or whatever combination. Hmm. Hmm. Well, interesting. Um, so in terms of management of these invasions, uh, I'm, not sh I'm not aware of fungicides being used, um, but it is possible um, so certain fungicides are more specific to certain kinds of fungi. Uh, for example, there are fungicides that are specific, uh, fairly specific to our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, to the glomeromycota. Um, and so if you were trying to control those fungi, uh, you might be able to apply uh, a fungicide like that. Um, to control ectomycorrhizal fungi with a fungicide would be difficult because they are so diverse taxonomically. You have our, you have ascomycota and basidiomycota and lots of different lineages. And they're also closely related to many important fungi in the soil, like uh, the decomposers, the saprobes. Uh, and so if you were, you know, drenching the soil with a fungicide to control these fungi, you might be damaging the saprobic community. And uh, perhaps the arbuscular fungi would be damaged by the same uh, fungicides. It may depend on what system you're talking about. So in Australia, if you were targeting the ectomycorrhizal fungi of pines, uh, certainly the fungicides that you used would also damage the uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi of the native eucalyptus. So that would be a difficult technique to apply. Um, one uh, alternative approach would be to simply try to eradicate the pines themselves. And luckily, most of these ectomycorrhizal fungi cannot thrive without their pine hosts. So that has been the approach that has often been used is to is aggressive uh, girdling of pine trees and removal of pines. And without those hosts, the, the, the fungi uh, will eventually die out. Although, uh, you know, there's a, a long living spore bank. So uh, certainly many of the students must know about the phenomenon of a seed bank with plants. Uh, this is a, a long lived set of seeds that are persistent in the soil and they can germinate many years later. Um, some really interesting work from Tom Bruns's lab over the years has shown that rhizopogon spores, these are spores from uh, rhizopogon, which is one of the suiloid fungi. It's a it's a, a false truffle that occurs with pines commonly in invasions uh, that their spores can probably live for decades uh, in the soil for 10, 20 or more years uh, and are, are highly persistent. So uh, getting rid of the pines will be a first, would be a first step, uh, but you have to remember that the fungal spores will still be there. Yeah, I suppose the, the application of, of fungicides for, for studying Selective fungicide, a topical application in certain uh, cases, uh, especially if it's a plant surface application, it can be useful, but for my mycorrhizal fungi, possibly not the, very probably not the way to uh, design your experiment. Mm 
Okay, our next question comes from William, who says that uh, beside the changes in soil biogeochemistry, how would the ectomycorrhiza fungal invasion interact with native microbiota? Is any study focusing on it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something that I'm really interested in. And so are uh, my collaborators. And um, uh, so uh, I would say that I don't know of studies that are focusing on, on this yet. Um, they need to be, we need studies like this. Um, one baseline is, you know, studies like Redis's, uh, Redis Vilgeli's uh, soil metagenomic study in Australia, you know, he's identifying not just the ectomycorrhizal fungi, but also uh, all of the fungi in the soil. So this includes, potentially includes the pathogens, the saprobes, um, and the ecto fungi associated with the native eucalyptus. And this will give us a baseline of who are the organisms that are there, who, who are present. Um, secondly, uh, I know that um, my collaborators, Sunny Lau and Coco Chen and, and others are pushing forward with um, metatranscriptomics studies. Uh, Jonathan Plett and others are working on metabolomics in these systems. And if you can identify the uh, uh, proteins and genes and um, uh, other important molecules associated, and you can associate them with particular microbes, particular uh, ectomycorrhiza fungi that are invasive, particular native fungi, um, and then we may be able to start linking functional uh, molecules and genes with the types of interactions that they mediate uh, and identify um, how some of these soil microbes may be interacting. Um, it also, once you have a list of these fungi, um, Redis has also been accumulating observations of uh, fruiting bodies of um, not only the invasive ecto fungi, but also uh, native ecto fungi, uh, invasive, pathogens, saprobic fungi that are common in these systems. And Redis's lab, they've been culturing as many of these fungi as possible. So far, focusing mostly on the ectomycorrhizal fungi, but uh, I know that they're interested in working on developing cultures of uh, the saprobes as well, for example. And uh, I think that's part of the answer is what you really need to be doing is developing an experimental system where you have some of these organisms in culture and you can present them with each other in different combinations to ask how they're interacting with each other. Um, uh, another approach is to look at correlations across the landscape. So if you have 300 plus study sites like Redis Vilgelis does, and you can look at co-variation of fungi with each other, you may be able to see certain species of native fungi that are either positively or negatively associated with these invasive, with particular invasive fungi, uh, which might give you some hypotheses about some interactions that are going on uh, as well. So I'm just uh, speculating, but I don't know of studies that are actually moving into the really the, the heart of your question, which is I think really a, a great question and, and needs more, uh, certainly needs more work. Yeah, we, we have a, um, a master's student who's going to defend uh, in two weeks' time. She basically uh, compared the, the nitrogen cycle um, uh, enzymes, well, basically the genes um, that, are, that can be expressed in the nitrogen cycle, uh, comparing a pinus taeda uh, uh, plantation with native araucaria. Um, and so in, the, in this study, she, she looked at bacteria and archaea, principally. Now, uh, hopefully she's going to continue in a PhD where she will use the extracted DNA to actually look at fungi, total fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, and the composition uh, of uh, these uh, uh, communities and try cool. to exta establish the potential um, uh, linkages that the introduction of, of pine could have caused. Okay, um, 
So William, if you're interested, you can come back for more to us or to Jason, obviously. Uh, Dora Vilela, um, uh, Dora would like to know if you have any results on the response of ectomicrobes of fungi and phosphorus. Mm. Uh, well, I did uh, show one slide. Uh, so we have um, definitely interest in phosphorus. Uh, and in fact, some of Corinne's analyses have shown uh, that there is a decrease in phosphorus um, in the invaded sites uh, compared to the native eucalyptus forest in Australia. Uh, this decrease in phosphorus, we don't know yet whether that's in response to the fungi or whether the fungi are choosing those sites, um, but that is a, a pattern that is emerging. Um, and I know that uh, in Jenny Botnagar's lab, they are interested in moving forward also with experimental approaches to this question and manipulating nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, but I don't know the status of those studies. But that's, that's part of what needs to happen next, and I, I'm sure Corinne is uh, working on that is to uh, experimentally tease apart, um, you know, the cause and effect with nitrogen and phosphorus. But certainly the, the pattern seems to be that these ectomycorrhizal invasions in Australia seem to be associated with lower phosphorus in soils compared to the native eucalyptus plantations or native eucalyptus forests, which already have very low phosphorus. So it's somewhat remarkable that the fungi, the ectomycorrhizal fungi could come in and, and draw down the phosphorus even further. Okay, uh, we have another question this time from Mateusz. He is trying to look at the, the applied part of, of, of the potential of, of these, uh, bringing in uh, ectomycorrhizal species or bringing in ectomycorrhizal, ectomycorrhizal plant species or uh, uh, fungal species. And he would like to know if you have any idea about the uh, ongoing um, efforts to either enhance the potential of uh, plant species by uh, selectively uh, inoculating them with uh, potentially better yielding uh, uh, in terms of uh, plant uh, growth uh, fungi or the other way around, uh, basically domesticating, if you like, the ectomicrosa fungi, uh, linking them, uh, making them productive, that would be then marketable. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, uh, yes and no. So um, in pine forestry, there have been many efforts historically to explore uh, inoculations to enhance forestry. And it, it, has not, uh, it has not taken on a widespread use um, for whatever reason. There, there are often results that seem promising, uh, but I think what happens is that in, in uh, large scale forestry, the cost of doing inoculations has often outweighed uh, so far, the potential benefits uh, of inoculating with fungi. Um, but we are making some progress in, um, for example, we have a meta-analysis uh, showing that uh, the inoculations with fungi from the same site where the plants come from actually is quite a bit more beneficial than inoculating with uh, any other fungi. And so utilizing local inoculum uh, native local inoculum may be a beneficial, a more beneficial strategy, um, but it has not come into wide uh, use yet. Uh, one exception I'll mention is not in pine forestry, but in fact in uh, the cultivation of truffles and nut trees. So for example, in the Southeastern United States, uh, here we grow pecans uh, this is a species of caria, which is a nut that is commonly eaten here. And pecans, uh, it turns out, you can cultivate a truffle uh, uh, in the genus Tuber. It's in the same genus as the famous uh, black and white truffles in Europe. And you can uh, encourage this truffle on the roots of pecan trees in orchards. And 
Uh, there are efforts underway to inoculate pecan seedlings with the spores of this truffle and to encourage these truffles. And that this would be a nice addition to uh, the nut crops that are grown in these uh, orchards uh, for farmers or, or uh, perhaps others who they're leasing to, to harvest, to be able to harvest truffles from these plantations of, of nut trees as well. Um, in fact, I'm training my dogs to try to find these uh, pecan truffles in orchards in Mississippi. And I have a student who is finding the, the DNA already of these uh, pecan truffles on the roots of pecan trees in Mississippi. And um, we're uh, hoping that the dogs will start finding the truffles pretty soon as well. Okay, brilliant. Uh, you have another question here from Leonardo who says, I'm not sure if he meant uh, ectomycorrhiza or AMF, but the question is, is there any relationship between the mycorrhizal interaction with colonized pinus and increased root exudates? Hmm. Uh, well, uh, certainly mycorrhizal fungi influence the exudates from roots. Um, we see different exudates from roots that are colonized versus uncolonized, and we see different exudates from roots that are colonized by one ectomycorrhizal fungus versus another. Um, what we need to understand more is exactly the function of those exudates. Uh, what are they doing? Um, are they byproducts of plant metabolism? You know, this is one hypothesis that is gaining some traction is that many exudates from roots are simply uh, byproducts from plants that uh, they need to get rid of. Um, but certainly there's evidence that many exudates are for communication with soil microbes, that uh, plants may be communicating with pathogens or with saprobes or with ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, there is evidence that especially, uh, for example, especially terpenes um, uh, that are produced by plants, maybe signaling with fungi, terpenes produced by fungi, maybe signaling with plants. Um, exudates from the fungi themselves, um, for example, uh, may also be important for communication with other soil microbes. Um, we really need more meta met metabolomics in these contexts. Uh, and, um, and then follow-up studies, not just to show which molecules are there, but testing particular molecules and their functions. So um, Sunny Lau and Coco Chen have done some really interesting work showing particular, uh, uh, the expression of particular genes um, is associated with the symbiosis of pines and uh, their uh, Suillus ectomycorrhizal fungi. And those genes are the genes that produce certain exudates and certain signaling molecules. And now we also really need experimental studies testing the functions of those molecules. Okay, thank you, Jason. Could I just, uh, you showed that uh, a new work in Argentina, in Cordoba. Um, I was wondering what you were showing there, that basically the, the distance is not, not a, a good predictor of uh, ectomycorrhizal fungal richness that are associated with uh, colonizing pine trees. Instead, it's basically the, the age when the pine tree established itself. Okay. Um, now, basically for, for, for a pine seedling to come into contact with uh, the suitable or required uh, ectomycorrhizal fungal species, they need to be at the same time at the right place. Um, so the question is, I mean, they have different, uh, they, they follow different dispersal patterns. Obviously the spores are, you may imagine that uh, much, much more um, uh, homogeneously um, distributed, dispersed, depending on the uh, atmospheric conditions, eddies, et cetera whilst the dispersal of pines is, is more limited. Um, so are you aware of any uh, studies that focus on the dispersal of uh, pine, different pine species and their ectomycorrhizal associates? Mm. 
Well, yeah, pines and other con other uh, pinaceae. Um, so certainly some of the first interesting work on this topic uh, was done by Martin Nunez and um, collaborators in Argentina also, um, looking at dispersal limitation in different taxa of ectomycorrhizal fungi and showing that uh, in those systems that they were looking at, certainly uh, there was a point at a distance away from plantations where the inoculum of ectomycorrhizal fungi, the spore densities were low enough that it actually limited the, the ability of the pines to, to spread, uh, pines and other conifers. Um, and the background there is comes from native systems as well, where we know that dispersal abilities of different ectomycorrhizal fungi are quite variable. So uh, rhizopogon, which I mentioned earlier, is a, this false truffle that makes a little potato-like mushroom about this large. Um, those, I said, have they have persistent spores. Uh, they're mammal dispersed, so they get eaten by, uh, here in North America, they would get eaten by squirrels, uh, mice, and other rodents, um, voles, deer, uh, eaten, and then the spores are transported by the mammal and then through the gut of the mammal into the, the excrement and into the soil. Uh, and in places where mammals are moving abundant, moving uh, rapidly across the landscape, uh, this dispersal is quite efficient and those spores can be very persistent. Uh, Suillus also undergoes some of the same kinds of dispersal, but other kinds of mushrooms associated with pines uh, rely completely on aerial dispersal of the spores from a typical mushroom. And that aerial dispersal is sometimes not very efficient in sending the spores very long distances. And so many of those actually take longer to reach the outer edges of a, of an, of a, a an expanding population of pines. Um, and this is known well from pine systems in North America, Tom Bruns's work and other, and uh, Tom Horton and others at uh, in native pine systems after fires, when fires completely uh, wipe out all the adult trees, the first fungi to come in are suiloid fungi, rhizopogon, uh, suillus, also tuber. Uh, and then later you see um, some of these uh, later stage fungi coming in. Some fungi seem to be at all of these stages, but there are also late stage fungi, Amanita, Rushula, Lactarius that come in later. So in invasion systems, in a lot of places we see this pattern where um, at the edges of an invasion front, it's young pines and they are mainly colonized by these early stage fungi and it's presumably dispersal limitation of some of the other fungi that are keeping them uh, in part from being associated with those early invasions. But there are also natural successional dynamics that may involve competition. Um, some of these fungi come in and may eventually be good competitors on the roots of mature trees. And so as the trees mature and grow older, uh, the community diversifies and you see more and more fungal species uh, perhaps due to competitive dynamics, uh, some of those species are able to persist. Um, they may not be as good at dispersing, but they are, they are good at maintaining their space on the roots once they get there. And so in the Cordoba system, it seems like uh, there has been time, the time and spatial dynamics have been such that you have mature, you've ended up with mature trees far away from the plantation and those mature trees that are 30, 40, maybe 50 years old in some cases have very well-developed fungal communities. And this is presumably a function of time and the normal successional dynamics that happen and have been shown to happen in native systems. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it was basically just uh, trying to <laughs> Get you get you get your ideas about it. And it's yeah. interesting. We are we are going to be uh, taking part in an international project, and one of the it's called Life Plan. And one of the sampling that we are going to do is aerial uh, spore sampling 
uh, regularly in a in a set place. But uh, what uh, what was very useful your an in uh, listening to you, your answer that uh, it just came to me now that uh, anyone interested, the student interested, they could use the equipment and uh, do a, a distance sampling from sources of. Um, well, from plantations where uh, concentrated source of, uh, of spores and see how really in different um, uh, landscape configuration it is distance or not distance mm -hmm. it's true and and there are a lot of techniques that can be used um, I didn't really mention this explicitly but a common type of experiment in these studies is called a bioassay and uh, so uh, this involves taking soil samples from different sites and then introducing pine seedlings into those soils in the laboratory and then what happens is the um, spores of the fungi germinate in those soils and, and grow onto the roots of the pine seedlings and then the researcher can then sample the ectomycorrhizal fungi from the roots of those pine seedlings and use simple fairly inexpensive uh, Sanger sequencing of the fungal tissues to identify the fungi on the roots of the seedlings. And so this is a way of pulling out the DNA from the soil and, and sequencing it. And then you can get an idea, especially of the spore bank fungi. So you're taking soil from the field and presumably only, only has spores uh, uh, and not uh, a lot of active mycelium. And then those spores colonize the, the plants and you can identify the fungi after that. It doesn't, it's not a perfect representation of what's there, but it's one view. Um, and then an, another approach that can be used is to look at the spores themselves. You can actually, with, um, with ectomycorrhizal fungi, um, and especially with truffles, you can identify the spores at least to the genus level just from their morphology. So there's a, there are guides to the genus identification from spore morphology. So you could sample the, the scat of mammals and uh, at different distances, for example, from uh, pine plantations or other habitats and, and uh, take them apart and look for the spores of the truffles that they're eating. Um, and that's a technique that has been used in native systems. I don't know of it being done in, in exotic uh, invasion systems, but it, it could be applied presumably if there are mammal dispersers that are there and you could if you could gather the their um, their fecal matter that that's often been done here with uh, flying squirrels that can be encouraged to use um, nest boxes or roosting boxes and then they they use the boxes and then you can collect their their droppings from inside the box and then dissect them to look for the spores of the truffles okay um i think we're running out of questions i could uh, keep asking you various um, other other questions but i think that people are probably heading towards the the canteen or or the, the lunch table so i think we we better close it jason i would like to thank you very much uh, once more it was an excellent uh, way of showing us how complex ecology is thank you very much Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.